we can start okay good evening uh, everyone today in our series of ortho lectures today is uh, examination of hip and master is professor sanjay dhar everybody knows him and sir has 30 years of experience vast teaching experience and uh, he has been uh, hod in uh, various hospitals and now in dy patil and uh, i am really thankful for dr sanjay dhar to accepting and he is also our guide in uh, this program and now uh, i will uh, agnivesh is our coordinator and all this program is made by him so over to dr dhar thank you very much thank you siddharth can you hear me yes yes sir we can thank hear you thank you agni uh, thank you once again for giving me this opportunity to teach a little bit uh, now this program is quite a unique program in fact that you have been hearing lots of webinars and but we thought you know, this is dr siddharth's idea basically that we should have some pg teaching where we teach basic pg teaching like examination and all that uh, so far we i think we have had three uh, webinars so this is the fourth one probably so i'll be talking about purely and strictly only on hip examination we are not discussing any particular pathology and uh, we will be purely as uh, as far as exam based hip examination hip as you know i think every pg uh, will uh, most probably the chances of almost 90 95% are that you will get a hip case in your exam and um, if you do hip case well uh, consider yourself passed uh, because hip is a very mathematical examination it's a lot of point based examination that you do all you present all the signs you present all the um, uh, gait and all that if you present that very nicely I'm sure no examiner can dare to fail you. So if you do hip examination well, well you probably are true. So, uh, and it is very interesting. Uh, I'm personally, I'm not biased towards hip, but as compared to your knee or an elbow, hip examination is very mathematical and very interesting. So uh, I will start. So first, as usual, anatomy. I'm sure most of you know the anatomy very well. Uh, I have not uh, stressed on anatomy. It is a ball and socket joint, a very um, stable joint uh, as compared to many other joints, similar joints like shoulder. It's a very stable because it is surrounded by very important structures and very strong structures from uh, both muscular uh, as well as ligamentous, as well as the architecture of the joint is so um, compact that it's a very stable joint. It's very, very um, uh, uncommon to have a hip dislocation unless there is a very uh, severe trauma and a car accident or something like similar. Otherwise, dislocations of hip are much uh, less common as compared to any other joint like shoulder or elbow. And reduction also is very difficult. So because it's uh, very surrounded by very strong structures. Uh, so just a brief thing. It has a, a cup-like joint which has a triradiate cartilage which is connected with the femoral head with the ligamentum teres and there are um, obturator fossa is very near. Then there are ischiofemoral ligament, ischio uh, uh, ilium, uh, this um, uh, ligamentum teres and these are very strong ligaments and they hold the hip very tightly. Then there are strong muscles. You can see the posterior, the gluteus maximus, then rotators and then the psoas and hamstrings. They are from the, uh, on the front there is cordyceps tendon and then adductors magnus uh, medially so these are very very strong muscles there is a lot of stress and um, force um, uh, um, which is particularly in the proximal part of the femur there are very strong muscles all around so that's why it's a very thick bone there's a very thick cortical bone there and it's very difficult to get a fracture of proximal femur except in the th uh, neck area which is which is a, um, a little weaker bone but if in the proximal femur, the trochanter or the intertrochanteric area, the fractures are, uh, it's very difficult, particularly in young people to get fractures. But as it is a lot of stress-based joint, there's a lot of stress of muscular stress. So once there is weakness, it becomes weak. So that's why you get ward strangle. If you know the ward strangle in the neck, 
that is the first site where you can get osteoporosis so that is why it becomes a uh, sort of a stress riser there so any fractured neck femur in old people is common because of that area which is becomes filled with fat as we grow older so these are strong muscles around it so you have to study when you are examining a joint you have to study all these muscles so you should be aware of which muscle is attached to where which muscle is um, um, uh, causing which motion so that you understand the whole uh, mechanics biomechanics of the joint so that you can go towards the diagnosis as you are aware of their function and their innervation and everything so extensors strong extensors like gluteus maximus hamstring abductors uh, gluteus medius and gluteus minimus and adductors is brevis longus and magnus so uh, they are all in groups medially laterally and posteriorly uh, which act in different directions so that they cause extension abduction and adduction so you have to be aware of these muscles and their action so that you know uh, particularly when you are assessing gait you should know that which gait is caused by which muscle so that uh, you understand the pathology mechanics of that gait so it's very important to know the muscle attachments as well as muscle innervation which muscle is innervated by which hello i hope there's no voice problem okay no no it's okay sir if there's any voice problem please uh, remind me i can because my net is little unstable i'm sure so coming to examination so first is as usual uh, although uh, i can very honestly in that in india particularly the places where i have worked things like introduction and being very social with the patient is a uh, something which we don't teach but as we now grow um, india is becoming a very um, uh, prosperous country so patient will expect these bedside manners so always as a habit introduce yourself that i am going to do this i am this doctor i am uh, examining you you can even tell that i am having examination so please cooperate some people may not um, be very cooperative but at least it is your duty and uh, mind you in places like frcs and all that these things are taken noted so be sure that even in india now examiners can be a little aware of these things so introduce yourself properly take consent for examination expose the patient properly so uh, expose means you should um, respect the dignity of the patient if you are a female patient properly get your screen if there is no screen you have to ask the examiner that i need a screen so be sure that you uh, respect the dignity of the patient so don't just push it uh, and um, mind you as i told you some examiners may be very particular if they notice this you are not taking the uh, respecting the dignity of the patient so be sure that how you expose and take consent for everything and then proceed for examination couch many times you may get a simple bed which is like in government hospitals i have seen and i was also examiner uh, they have very shabby beds and which are um, uh, not very so there you can at least be aware of that bed and then tell the examiner suppose there is a mistake in your flexion deformity assessment or something you can tell that i don't have a hard bed i would prefer to have a hard bed uh, so that you can proceed so uh, these things are very important now earlier but now that like in a place like apollo hospital you will have all these beds and examiner you uh, will expect you to be uh, uh, use these tools it's like screen and all that so be sure that they are available and if they are not available at least remind the examiner that they were not available that's why you had um, there might be some difference in assessment so coming to history history is the most important base that is it is on which you build up your uh, diagnosis on which you build up your plan how you uh, move ahead so uh, the history has to be detailed take time uh, in taking history so they follow the same routine which we must have done in your mbbs also so it is inspection palpation movements measurement special tests but history remains the base where on which you can build up your case so and as an examiner point of view i can tell you that uh, uh, most of the times the examiner will not um, confirm the history from the patient did you say this unless you are giving a sort of a contrarian point you are giving something which is not matching with your uh, other point then suddenly examiner may awaken but then uh, how you drive your diagnosis to your diagnosis your history will decide that so if you ask history and ask those relevant points and then keep presenting that at different points of time 
your examiner will get convinced that you are asking everything and then be sure that you have a plan as far as history is asking you so don't just randomly ask fever and then suddenly you go go to that did you fall last year did you have some disease like this so i mean first make up your mind then what you are going to so the chief complaint decides your history taking so the, how the patient uh, ask very leading question that um, what is the chief complaint what is his main problem so once you do, once he does that you uh, sort of sort um, uh, diversify on that you just decide that what else you are going to ask and then make a plan in your brain or uh, you can even write most of the times uh, yeah. the paper uh, hello? hello okay so most of the times there is a paper uh, available with you so you can uh, keep writing that what points you have um, uh, you have to ask and sort of it should be like a uh, flow chart that you are going to ask this you are going to ask that so uh, that will sort of make your life very easy so first is chief complaint so you have to ask direct question what is your main, main problem sometimes patient may be little vague in asking suppose he will come with i have pain in last three two months so uh, try to diversify on that but then if that is not his main problem, as you keep asking the history suddenly you might realize that his main problem is limp so don't be blatir ka fakir that usne pain bola to pain hi bolna hai so present it in a more um, uh, appealing way to the examiner that he is uh, his parents have noticed a limp or you have noticed uh, he has noticed a limp but he has simultaneously got pain also so you can sort of uh, what good students do what how distinctions are ultimately got is by giving a spin to the whole story so that you sort of you, this is a mind game with your examiner it is a mind game so how you present how you package the whole history and the case to the examiner he should have no uh, no reason to diversify from the track you have laid it is like a trap you are laying for him so tum aa ja main ye pooch main ye jawab de raha hu he will ask this question you are ready you know that his after all he is also human you are also human so if you give him ice cream he will jump for it so you have to keep asking questions and presenting those findings to the examiner in a way so that you sort of lead him towards that thing so I'll, unless you commit a mistake and but most important is that you should be truthful don't try to get something which is not there you can modify it you can slightly present it with less impact or more impact but you should not get a false finding which that will catch you then you are gone so present your symptoms and chief complaints very uh, look at them and be very sure what patient is complaining about and then slowly build up on that so you should take each complaint so let us take pain first so pain uh, it's like mbbs teaching it is not something ms you change something radically after mbbs same thing pain when was the duration when was it presented um, how long is the pain there whether there is night pain whether there is so all these things should be very and if there you are finding anything which is very important suppose night pain suppose he says that night pain then you catch it so there is night pain you think that it is um, uh, nocturnal pain so that might be something like tuberculosis or whatever so then you sort of highlight it so there is sir there is lot of night pain every day night he has to wake up so add two more words so add, add adjectives to that so when you are sure so if there is no night pain don't present night pain but if he is night pain then you sort of highlight it so that at the end you know that this was tuberculosis and so he will only ask you that what is the relevance of night pain so you get one question and you get a an answer which is correct so you get points so that is what is important so be very uh, practical and be very uh, crooked in your presentation so that you are sort of giving him ball um, pull toss and then he is hitting it and you have to you know that he is going to hit it and you know where to catch it so keep on uh, doing that while presentation then so pain has to be elaborated completely uh, uh, timing of pain duration of pain presentation of pain how is it so be very uh, rigid in that like it is mbbs so remember mbbs and ask same question question doesn't change your impact and your presentation will change so keep asking the same don't say, now i am in ms i should not ask this funny questions like kitna din se pain hai how long it has been there how this is that is very relevant and once while asking questions you can ask any silly, silly question but while presenting you have to modify, modify so do it that way so coming to swelling so suppose there is a swelling there what is the location of the swelling how often the swelling has been there since how long the swelling has been there so that you have to keep asking so then so so 
so that finally patient will give you vague answer that it was there last winter now it is not there that doesn't mean that you bore the examiner with the same wording that you don't have to be totally true to patient's word but you have to modify it like suppose you know that in all the five questions you asked about swelling that it was there last year this was no presently there now with summer in winter it increases so then you can sort of modify it that it has been present for last 3 months but it is only become very prominent now in last one month so something like that so be sure what you that's what i said you make a plan what questions you are asking ask all the silly questions but when you are presenting to the examiner sort of modify it package it very well so that your examiner is understanding your thinking and you are also understanding his thinking that what question is going to ask so then uh, this so this was about hip pain swelling and then deformities usually in hip they will present with abduction deformity adduction deformity flexion deformity so that you have to highlight so uh, how is he his attitude even while asking history he will say that i am my leg i cannot move this leg out and in or something like that so that you have to you may not don't don't in the history don't tell the examiner that he has a flexion deformity that means you are you are yet to, uh, you have already examined the patient and you probably know this so tell him that patient is saying that he has a inability to move the limb, limb out he cannot squat in the toilet so that means abduction is not there so so again as i told you package it will be so when you present it like that instead of telling him that he has an adduction deformity you can tell him that he is not able to squat in the to indian toilet that gives a lot of impact right, in history everything has its right place in the right history may ye chalega but examination you can't say that he is not sitting in the toilet examination you have to say adduction deformity so be very sure how you define these deform presentations these chief complaints then coming to limp limp is a very limp, as far as hip examination is concerned limp is a very important finding and a complaint so patient will many times come you that i am like in perkins disease the child will always say that he the parents will say that they noticed limp patient is limping he is sagging towards one side or whatever so this is this has this is a very important presentation and important chief complaint so you have to highlight that when is he limping how long he has been limping is the limp more in the early morning or whether it is the whole day it is the same limp has it deteriorated thing like that so ask questions for every chief complaint you have to ask lots of questions but then that doesn't mean that you bore the examiner with all those answers which are not relevant also ultimately at the end of examination you must notice that limp was insignificant there was nothing in the limp it was just that he had an injury and then he started limping for few days and he was fine but now he has got complaints so don't be presenting your uh, chief complaints very truthfully as a patient told you but try to modify that is how a good presentation is looked at by the examiner that this fellow has been able to define the whole thing and present in a good package and then he is moving smoothly you should realize by the time your history is finished there should be no question from the examiner if he has started asking question that means you are losing point so you should have finished your examination in 10 minutes or 7 minutes um, and there has to be there has to be pin drop silence you should have presented everything and examiner is just looking at you and he is having no question because you have answered all his queries in his mind so that is how your history and examination should be so finally stiffness so again these are the very common findings i have um, sort of pointed out here which hip generally hip case is present with so pain swelling deformities limp and stiffness so every finding you have to elaborate every point in finding you have to explore go deeper into it is there any relevance to my diagnosis is there any relevance to my presentation that examiner will suppose you want uh, Um, you have some brilliant in the mind. You have some. You know everything about limp. You know everything about the gait. So suddenly limp, he might ask you in the history. Suppose his tube light also examiner also suddenly notices it. He will ask. So you should be ready with. Otherwise, don't highlight that finding. If you are, um, don't know anything about the gait, then don't keep asking, saying limp, 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 limp. Just keep it little low. Keep it at the end and present it like that. So that is how it has to be. So learn. As I told you, this is an art. it is a mind game with an examiner so i know there are very poor students who have not read throughout their ms but they pass brilliantly because they know the art of history taking art of presentation and they have already they know the case because most of the departments help you but then they have mastered the art of presentation very nicely because ultimately the aim of the examination is not to check your knowledge it means 
aim of this ms examination that is the beginning of your career so we don't want to trouble you by asking you all the classifications and all that is beyond that is either you have failed or you are going beyond 75% if they have started asking you classifications and what we want to know is how, what is your uh, way of dealing with the patient what is your way of presenting a patient what is your way of thinking about a patient so that is what is most important for an examiner at least um, examiners i have been with so that is how it is so that is how you have to deal with so your presentation has to be very slick and very uh, to the point so pain as i told you duration onset progression grades of pain if you know that great if you don't know then you may not talk about it but there are grades of the, suppose somebody may if you want good marks you can say vas score there is how how you calculate vas score so things like that sight and nature the wire where is it present in the front of the hip or on the sides of the or in the posterior part because you have to differentiate between a back ache and a sciatic pain and a hip pain um, it is becomes very important in the history so if you are trying to prove, uh, present a diagnosis which is looking little odd the way the history is. suppose there is history of hip arthritis but patient is saying more thigh pain leg pain then you have to be very sure about these things which you present to the examiner that his pain is then you have to highlight that sir his pain is more in the uh, anterior side uh, as the patient is able to hold his like generally if there is an intra articular pain the patient will say that hold his trochanter and above and his fingers are in the anterior uh, this femoral triangle and his thumb is on the posterior side so they will sort of they will squeeze the hip and tell you that i have pain here while a sciatic pain they will keep their hand on the lumbosacral junction towards the posterior uh, superior iliac spine they will keep their fingers there so that is that is a very fine art which you should know as you are history asking history so um, uh, there are so many times i am sure senior people agni is there dr sadhav is there when the patient starts walking in your opd you know the half the diagnosis you know that what is he, he is having unless he is a non specific person but if there is a clear pathology patient you will know at least 30% to 50% times that he is this limb is a disc pain or he is an hip arthritis he is limping he is avian so that is what is observation plus how you plan your next examination is very important so continuity coming to continuity whether it is radiating pain i am sure you must be knowing radiating pain is that it from the point of origin to the um, there is a continuous pain there is no intervening area of um pain free area while referred pain will be something which is remotely present so that i am sure you know in your mbbs class so then rest pain whether it is a vascular pain or it is a um, uh, it is a claudication pain so again you have to differentiate patient will say that he sometimes he may just say that he has calf pain and thigh pain while walking so you have to differentiate between that i am sure in spine examination dr agnish told you how to what is the difference between neurogenic and um, uh, vascular pain so rest pain whether it is um, on the rest also so again night pain comes there whether on the night in, uh, sleeping he gets a, um, pain he suddenly wakes up that means the articular cartilage uh, is eroding because the muscles are relaxing so suddenly he will get night pain and he has to wake up which may not be case in a sciatic pain while he is resting he may, will be comfortable it's only on sitting and standing he gets pain so that is very important and these you have to be awake to this while you are asking history so once you are awake to this then you will be able to decide and then you will present it very nicely if you are not know the uh, the relevance of a of a complaint then you will get lost then you are not um, able to present it very nicely then he will suddenly ask is this night pain or then you are lost then i did not ask this question now what do i do then i use say something wrongly no sir he has no night pain then suddenly examiner will ask the patient is there night if you get pain in night he will say yes i get in night so you are caught so you are you are um, you are gone almost so all these things uh, keep a point make a points make some points on your paper that for pain what all things you need to ask so everything has to be covered you may not present it but then you have al already asked and when the examiner is there you know the answer you have already asked it you may not you know, miss while presenting it but you have asked the question so be very meticulous and thorough in asking the discussing the chief complaints and going very detailed about them 
so duration uh, swelling onset progression whether it is stationary or it is progressively whether it is a neoplastic lesion it is so slowly progressing or it is always there like you know, these impingement syndromes and all that they have they are constant in particular some motion so you have to ask these questions so increasing or regressing whether it is progressively increasing in avian as the arthritis progresses he will keep deteriorating but it will be very slow process so you have to again as i told you you have to be very detailed in asking these uh, discussing these chief complaints then limp limp is again as i told you duration onset progression of limp how what is the uh, how, whether he uses um, uh, he has been limping like this for last 6 months so it you mean it is a stationary limp whether he need progressively he has used aid um, crutches or he has needed help so that means there is something which is rapidly progressing a neuro neuromuscular condition or severe arthritis is going on something like that or he has become wheelchair bound so ask these questions limp don't just say limp and then you forget about it so unless you have asked these questions so all these things have to be written and as i told you like a flow chart you have to keep asking them questions you may not tell him that he is wheelchair bound you can suddenly say that he is limp which has progressed very severely then he will ask you or you may add it that is their wheelchair bound and or he has become bedridden in last one month and he was limping for three months so try to ask every uh, finding every chief complaint should be very meticulously and detailed uh, discussion about that should be done with the patient as well as finally with the examiner so then finally summarize the history so once you have done the whole thing then you summarize what you are going to summarize and then what you are going to present to the examiner don't bore him as i told you with the, every detail that he was sleeping at work. patient will bore you because patient will उस रात को मैं 12 बजे सोया फिर मैं एक बजे उठा फिर सवा दो बजे मैंने ये किया फिर मैं बाथरूम गया फिर बाथरूम में मुझे ये हुआ सो डोंट यू डोंट हैव टू रिपीट ऑल दैट यू हैव टू गेट द जिस्ट आउट ऑफ दैट यू हैव टू गेट द पल्प आउट ऑफ दैट एंड देन पैकेज इट वेरी नाइसली एंड देन प्रेजेंट इट द एग्जामिनर सो बी श्योर व्हाट यू हैव आस्क्ड एंड देन बी श्योर व्हाट यू आर गोइंग टू प्रेजेंट बट इट प्रेजेंट इट इन अ वेरी ब्रीफ एंड वेरी क्रिस्प मैनर सो दैट पेशेंट एग्जामिनर डजंट हैव एनी क्वेश्चन टू आस्क यू इन द हिस्ट्री एट लीस्ट so once you have done the summary of acute is a chronic pain it is progressive it is non progressive it is monoartic polyarticular possible etiology so at the end of the history you have to make a diagnosis so that is you should make that as a habit don't wait for diagnosis at the end of the examination so even in your brain that is in your opd also uh, that is a habit even i do when i ask in the history i know that this is probably at um, avian so uh, then i will basically particularly i may miss some finding or a examination point if i have not made a diagnosis i will not be i may suddenly miss a point so always try to make a habit of making a diagnosis is a provisional diagnosis not a definite you can change it later but at least make a provisional diagnosis that is hip arthritis chronic hip arthritis most probably tuberculosis make it in your mind you are not going to tell the examiner unless the examiner asks you he may not ask you diagnosis at the end of the history many times i do ask generally even after the history that what is your diagnosis now before the examination so then you come up that most fully said it might be tuberculosis that time i will not catch you with a very specific diagnosis i want perfect diagnosis and it should not be wrong later but it is just a suggestion that the right now i am thinking on the lines of infective arthritis it may be chronic or it may be semi acute like thing something like that so at least you once you know that then you start thinking about examination so how you proceed the examination what investigation you should think of so that process will already start in your mind while you are examining also the things are going mere ko asr bhi puchna padega tabhi mere ko ye bhi puchna padega tabhi so all that you keep on your computer has started working so and then at also at the end of the history what is he expecting what is the patient demand what is his expectation so a polio person coming to you with uh, he is not expecting he will just expect you that you give him a good gait Uh, efficient gait so that he can walk he can do routine things or a polio person suddenly has got knee arthritis or a hip arthritis he will expect that his pain should go he will not expect you to walk um, make him walk normally so that is what your expectation so again that helps you in uh, planning management planning treatment so if you know that this fellow suppose avian patient comes to you he has pain but he is has been doing everything uh, so far is doing okay is not is just getting pain while driving motorcycle while on squatting in the uh, bathroom or toilet 
he is getting pain otherwise he is sir okay whole day i am fine but evening i get lot of pain so then there you don't rush to tell him that i'll do thr tomorrow you can wait you can uh, i am of course after the x ray so that gives you a sort of it is not only for the examination but for also for the practice point of view suppose um, even i have lost so many patients because i told them distal radius fractures i told them middle need plating but they they will think are sir a chota sa to fracture hai but I, i was told surgery they may do it still with the second surgeon or the third surgeon but you should sort of so develop the patient develop the treatment and diagnosis tell him that there is a fracture in this place there is this problem or same way is this avn the circulation is there so there is so with the patient also this is not for your exam point of view but for your patient dealing matter so that you don't lose your patient if you tell avn first grade one that you are going to do surgery tomorrow or day after then he might run away he might go somebody somebody will tell him no no you take right now medication we will see for 3 years so that is how you develop so develop, of course always ask patient's expectation and demand what is his need from uh, this by coming to you and, and deciding so that will help you in even presenting it to the examiner that suppose you tell avn the treatment is thr he will tell you are you sure at grade 2 you should do thr so then you are then you start suddenly the negative feeling you come oh shit i have lost one uh, question and now he is going and then he will stretch you here and there then it is all rape then finally you get lost everywhere and you start losing everything so have a plan and then stick to it and not fool hardly not foolishly that you aap mein mera kya ek bar bol diya to salman khan ke jaisa you can change but then don't keep changing at every question he will say this no okay sir i will not do this he will say this i will okay sir i will not do that stick to some plan present it that way but you can modify it. now that you know that examiner ka need is that you do a ceramic on ceramic you should slowly okay you can tell sir okay there are other options available like ceramic so that doesn't uh, that doesn't make you weak but that doesn't make you foolish also if you suddenly keep changing usne allen donate bola you said okay sir i'll do allen donate if you have made a plan you should stick to it to a certain extent not foolishly but to firmly that you have a plan you have done it thought it it is your process you may differ but i have thought of this because of these reasons so that is how you present it so coming to examination then so as i told you once history is summarized you have to write down summary of the history and then write down how do you uh, what is your diagnosis that may be in your brain you may not tell your diagnosis if he is not asking you don't tell it but you make it that this is most probably tuberculosis of the hip so now examination will be on these lines so then at least you don't miss certain points at least about tuberculosis or even the differential diagnosis so examination is same as inspection palpation this like we can sort of make it little more uh, interesting by saying look feel move and measure so look first inspection feel palpation move is joint examination and then measure is length so hip is as i told you it's a very mathematical thing it is like you do these things you present these findings you are through so examination is over you are passing so by the time you come out with diagnosis and everything you are if your examination points are he is just asking you how do you do this you do this go on. fine so points keep on adding like a petrol pump ka this bill so do that and follow the follow this routine follow this algorithm if you do this you will finish it very nicely so in hip first is exposure so expose it very nicely as i told you uh, respect the dignity of the patient don't unnecessarily expose him keep uh, even males are very shy sometimes you can't Uh, expose them like the way you want it your exam stress doesn't mean to you have to stress him also so be sure that you are exposing what you need to expose but it should be enough that you should be able to do a good examination and also you should be able to compare it to the other side so hip is a symmetrical joint so you you should always compare it to the other side so first is most important bony landmark is anterior superior iliac spine greater trochanter uh, and uh, you should be able to see them very nicely and very clearly So if you have seen them and the gluteal fold, again the muscle bulk. So examination from the front, examination from the back, examination from the side. So all these three you should finish. So that's why I told you you should have a plan. If you are not uh, made a plan, you have you will miss examination from the ba- back because it is not spine or oh, hip. Oh shit, I forgot about it. But then if you miss gluteal wasting, you will probably lose marks. So it is that's why there is always has to be a plan. Front, back, side. 
So all these examination has to be done. So identify these points, mark these points with a marker pen or something. You can even mark greater trochanter uh, this um, line. You can profile of the greater trochanter. So anterior superior iliac spine, then even posterior superior iliac spine you can mark. So these these things add points to you. If you have done this very nicely and meticulously, the moment examiner sees this means this man has done it very nicely. If you are not fine, your lines are not seen, then probably I don't know whether he has done it. Then he'll ask you, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you done? So again, you are wasting time in co uh, these questions rather than presenting your findings. So look, inspection prerequisites, as I told you, it has to be a hard bed. It has to be an ex adequate exposure, comfortable, painless position. Don't make him patient very uncomfortable by not covering him properly. If he has a flexion deformity, try to give him a pillow underneath so that he is not uncomfortable. His spine is not arched too well. So maintain privacy, as I told you, and mark these points. So these greater trochanter lines, all these points you mark. Don't make it messy, but a little bit marking you should know so that they are visible to the examiner also. And then you can do proper measurements and major profiling also of these body landmarks. So that is how you cover it. Um, so first thing is if you see exaggerated lumbar lordosis, you should be able to put your hand under the bed. Uh, so don't put it uh, the palm upwards, put your dorsum upwards so that uh, if you put it palm, that means you're over the correcting because palm is a concave. Uh, from this, uh, this, so the, the spine might go down. So put it like this, so that you, the moment you flex, the, the moment the back touches your dorsum of the hand, that means that is the, um, that is the maximum uh, lum, uh, hip flexion you should do. So there should be no flattening of lumbar lordosis beyond that. But if you put it like this, it will go beyond. So it will be spine will be in little bit of flexion. So if there is exaggerated lumbar lordosis, again your antenna should rise that probably there's a fixed flexion deformity. So if patient is hiding that fixed flexion deformity, you have to reveal that. So by flexing the opposite hip, so see a flexion deformity. So first is exaggerated lumbar lordosis, and you might note this point. Then attitude of the limb. How is he keeping the limb? Whether he's keeping an adduction, tell him to correct it first. Attitude doesn't mean if he's lord of um, Nor Norfolk, then he will keep his legs cross legged and sleep like that because he's a veteran patient. He's been in the ward. We had patients who were there for two months and they would not sit. They know that these are students. They will not bother to keep his legs down. So don't let him to keep the limb like he's sitting cross legged on a bed on a chopal and he's giving sermons. So ask him politely, please keep your legs straight. So try to see that his legs are, uh, he's trying to make them straight. So it has to be, both legs have to be parallel. But if there's an adduction deformity, so don't try to stretch it, but tell him that you keep it as straight as possible uh, while you are examining it. Later, he can sit again like a lord. But meanwhile, let him keep it straight and parallel so that this is the attitude. That is the attitude of the limb. Then you have to write that, that this attitude is in limb, left limb is in adduction or it is in flexion or it is in internal rotation. The patella is facing upwards or it is facing outwards. The foot is facing out, little outwards, five degrees or it is facing straight, that means there is an internal rotation. So all these things have to be very visible and you have to notice them and you have to write down and then uh, see the ASIS levels both sides. As I told you, ASIS is the most important bony landmark around the hip. So you mark that, mark on the both sides. See that they are at the same level. If they are not, then that means there is an adduction deformity. Again, you have to reveal that deformity later as you palpate it. But when you are uh, inspecting it, when you are um, uh, looking at it, you just let it be the way he is keeping it. That is his attitude. So you have to present that as an attitude. So then swelling, scar, any sinus is on the uh, in the scar pass triangle or femoral triangle. Any old sinus, heel sinus, then any wasting around the uh, lateral side thighs or even in the supra um, uh, patellar area. Uh, that is the vastus media, uh, this vastus medialis area because that is the most common site. Even in hip pain. Patient is limping, of course, there's a fixed flexion deformity. Patient will walk with the limp, so his cordyceps is not uh, getting uh, fully extended. So his vastus medialis will waste. So he will get wasting of the vastus medialis. And that is the most prominent area where you can see thigh wasting or muscle cordyceps wasting. So we should notice that, you should note that. So this is inspection on lying down. As I told you, there is inspection on standing from the front, inspection from the side, and inspection from the back. In the back, you see gluteal wasting and the buttocks are there, whether they are symmetrical, whether they are the same size, and then AS, PSIS, if the dimples are in a different position, and then thigh buttock creases, if there are any different, suppose there's a subluxation or dislocation, the creases may be deviated up and down. So you have to notice 
so suppose you will not have plan you have not made a plan you will miss this so most usually i have seen student missing posterior examination in gap so then it is just creating a negative mark in your case you may still pass but then you have not um, sailed through so uh, coming to inspection again as i told you lumbar lordosis attitude of the hip flexion adduction position of sis apparent shortening wasting of thigh muscles gluteal muscles so wasting thigh muscles as i told you you it is a fixed point from the superior pole of the patella so roughly it should be equal or at least in adults around 6 cm but at the maximum muscle bulk so you take a tape and see that what is the maximum muscle bulk of that patient and then put a tape around it that is usually it should be around the vastus medialis area if you want to see vastus medialis that is you go lower down you go just above the superior pole of patella so that might be the first muscle to waste so then you don't go 6 cm up so that is to 6 cm or an equal point at the maximum muscle bulk is for quadriceps wasting whole thigh wasting so that is you mark a point on both sides and then measure it but if you are saying vastus medial is purely that means near the vastus medial where the muscle is so around superior pole of the patella you keep the tape and mark it so that is where you see vastus medial as i told you that is the first muscle to waste okay so once you have done that then uh, position of asi as i told you suppose they are at level, same level and limbs are parallel that means there is no adduction or abduction deformity but if they are not level that means there is some adduction or abduction it may be fixed or it may be just an attitude so if you are it is purely an attitude you will be able to correct it if it is not attitude it is a fixed deformity you will not be able to correct it uh, without moving the whole pelvis so that means you have to reveal the deformity so if there is a fixed deformity you have to reveal it by getting the full limb parallel so that the whole pelvis will start moving and your asi will come down it will be level so that amount of movement you made from getting it to the parallel position while the asis was at a different level to the same level of asis and then revealing the abduction deformity that you have to measure the angle between the vertical and the abduction amount of abduction you made that is the abduction deformity there are other methods which i'll show you later so then wasting of thigh muscles i told you direction of patella whether it is pointing towards the ceiling or it is pointing outward so that normally it is pointing outward so that means the normal antiversion angle is around 10 degrees so it is facing 10 degrees outwards so that is therefore suppose it is inwards that means there is an internal rotation deformity again you have to notice that and then you have to mark that then scar sinus swelling as i told you are there then coming to local temperature so only while you are doing palpation feel as i said feel the local temperature with the dorsum of your hand whether it is high vascular sign of narath is you feel for the femoral pulse if you are able to feel the femoral pulse equally that means vascular sign is negative if you are not able to feel the pulse that means the support which is the femoral head which provides it a support the vessel that is not there so position head is not in its position so you will pulse you may be either feeble or you may not be able to feel it that doesn't mean that may not mean that pulse is not there or the ischemia but it may be simply that there is back support is not there so hip is not in its normal position if your dorsal is pedis everything is present normally but the femoral pulse you are not feeling you should get um, suspect you should suspect that the vascular sign is positive so that we have to again notice so that is a finding probably it is an old subluxation or there is um, uh, the whole femoral head is completely gone so you sign is present then identify now we have to palpate the bony as i told you you mark the bony landmarks like trochanter profile and then feel them feel the thickness of the trochanter whether it is thickened whether the surface is smooth as it should be normally as compared to the opposite side or it is irregular rough or and then position also whether it is little migrated up as compared to the opposite side so feel these bony landmarks all asis the iliac crest the trochanter then adductor um, this uh, sorry pubic symphysis you should feel that so all these bony points should be marked they should be marked as well as they should be felt so whether there is whether they are in normal position or whether they are in abnormal position or there is any thickening or anything like that so all these things scar pass triangle that you have to mark like uh, the how and there you should feel the, and that scar pass triangle is also site of anterior joint line of the fem hip so if there is tenderness in the scar pass triangle that means it is hip tenderness so that means there is something intraarticular uh, causing some uh, intraarticular tenderness so uh, so you even if you hold the trochanter like this your thumb on the uh, scar pass triangle your palm around the trochanter 
and your fingers around the posterior part of the trochanter and then try to move this and there is tenderness anteriorly also on movement there is some wincing so that means there is an intraarticular pathology in the hip so you should notice that and uh, remember that so asis as i told you is a very important landmark you should mark them you should see their level whether they are at the same level if they are deviated then that means there is an abduction or an abduction deformity if there is an uh, it's very simple if you keep to um, if you stand your both limbs are parallel to each other and your asis is also in the same line so now you uh, adduct the hip if you adduct the hip uh, in a normal hip the asis will still remain the same thing but what will happen in a fixed hip so if you uh, adduct the hip the, the whole pelvis will go up so in an abduction deformity asis goes up remember that because you just follow that motion see if there is a normal hip movement you will move the hip so the limb will go laterally asis will remain in the same position but if it is a fixed hip there is no movement at the hip where will the movement the movement will occur at the pelvis so the whole pelvis will move along with the same side asi so it will go up so asi but now when you have to walk you will not walk with limb in abduction what will you do you will get the limb in neutral position towards this so what will happen the whole asi will go down so asi will be parallel your limb will be down uh, but uh, asi will go down when you are walking so that is why you have to notice this you have to remember these mechanics similarly if there is adduction the asi normally will go down towards down but once you get it into neutral position in walking ambulatory position the asi will go up so in an adduction deformity asi will be up in an abduction deformity asi will be down so remember that basically try to follow that movement then you will realize otherwise you will commit mistakes see it in a normal yourself you stand up and then fix your hip in abduction your asis will go up so but you, if you to walk you have to get foot to the ground then the whole pelvis with the limb will move down so asis will move down so when you are on the bed patient asis will be down in an abduction deformity in an abduction deformity asis will be up because the hip is fixed so that is something you should remember so whenever you are in doubt you do it on yourself you will realize what will happen so that is how you that is how i remembered it in my uh, post graduation that is how i want if you have any other method you can follow that but this is very simple if you do it the same motion on yourself and consider hip is fixed then you will realize what happens to the asi so you will not commit a mistake so reveal the deformity fixed flexion deformity as i told you you see the lumbar lordosis if the patient is trying to sit on the bed with limb parallel to the bed then your his lumbar lordosis will be exaggerated but the moment you reveal uh, you uh, the, the lumbar lordosis will become flat so for that you need to to flatten the limb you need to lift the normal limb flex it ask the patient to hold the flexion limb but you should not do it beyond what is needed so that is why you keep your left hand on the uh, under the lumbar lumbar region so that uh, the you feel the dorsum of the hand dorsum of uh, the spine on the dorsum of the hand so when it just touches your dorsum hand that means that is when your normal hip flexion stops so that is where you so your spine should be flat your uh, ischial tuberosity should not rise too much so you should not be flexing the pelvis so because again then your deformity will not be revealed so you should be just touching the spine and <clears throat> your asi uh, your ischial tuberosity your buttocks should not be lifted from the bed so that is what is the deformity as you can see this is the what is called as thomas test so that is how you reveal the flexion deformity similarly fixed adduction deformity as i told you once the um if you want to reveal the adduction deformity you get the limb uh, asi is normally in an adduction deformity will be higher so once you uh, get it down to the normal position <clears throat> as compared to the opposite asi your limb will go into adduction <clears throat> so that amount of adduction is the adduction deformity so once you are getting it to parallel to the other limb normal limb the asis will go up so because it's a fixed hip so similarly you remove reveal these deformities either adduction or abduction and uh, that is how you measure also them so amount of adduction which <clears throat> helped you to get asis into normal level that is with the vertical that is the adduction deformity or abduction the other method is kotari's method where you mark the asis <clears throat> i think i have a slide after that but anyway i'll tell you maybe i don't have that 
so once you mark the asis on both sides you draw a line between these two so whatever position suppose you are higher position you mark one line and once you reveal the adduction deformity there parallel from the normal uh, asis again draw a line so that angle is the uh, angle of deformity or what you can do is you can on the same asis you draw a vertical line which is 90 degrees to the asis and then the line once you have corrected that angle made with the between the two asis that is kothari's technique actually what i told you that you just reveal and unreveal the deformity that itself gives you an angle kothari you can mention as a method but it is very simple to measure it once you reveal or unreveal a deformity so once you keep it parallel they are higher and the amount of flexion uh, amount of adduction or abduction you need to get the asis to the same level is the deformity fixed deformity then uh, rotations you again see as i told you if the foot is pointing upward to the ceiling rather than 10 degrees outward that is the internal rotation deformity so that is the amount, you can use a cardboard or you can even draw an angle uh, between the second toe and the heel and see that what direction it is taking so you can measure the angle of internal rotation or external rotation deformity range of movement that is very simple you have to see range of movement of hip which is the affected joint then contralateral hip and then spine and knee all adjacent joints so every joint which is adjacent to your joint of pathology that you have to measure so spine is adjacent spine even sacroiliac you have to see whether there is any sacroiliac stiffness that is what you do i'll tell you the test later favorite test so that you have to see and then same side knee and opposite side hip these are adjacent joints so neighbors all these joints you have to see so that is uh, so never miss as i told you this is a plan which you have to make so never miss that so range of movement i am sure all of you know 0 to 120 degrees extension 0 to 20 degrees abduction 45 adduction 30 external rotation and internal rotation so all these you have to measure and if there is a fixed deformity you have to mention that and rotate it many times people um, by mistake they said that there is a fixed abduction deformity of 30 degrees then examiner asked a question how much is the abduction this is sir 5 degrees so that is, is very stupid so you have to be sure if there is a fixed abduction deformity there cannot be any abduction the so if there is a uh, fixed flexion deformity there won't be any extension so it is like that remember that so whenever there is a fixed deformity the opposite motion will not be there so it is so it is absent so don't get um, pulled up by that so many times they just want to stop you um, uh, and then give you a hard question in between and then you fumble and then they then they start laughing all four examiners will laugh and you will have a stressful time so uh, as as you uh, check motion so 0 to 120 degrees but if you passively want to add you can just push it you might get up to 140 degrees so it is all um, uh, individual variations you can have so then you can check for individual muscle suppose there is an iliopsoas tendonitis so if you ask him to do passively you might get pain so sitting you ask him to flex that is purely iliopsoas if you ask for active slr that is the other muscles are contributing to it quadriceps and all that so that is what you usually able to know this uh, if you are presenting an examination so you know that there is any pathology in a particular um, uh, muscle which is causing the stiffness or painful movement or a limp so thomas test as i already i told you you flex ask the patient to go and feel your hand is there uh, in the lumbar region um, i would prefer um, keeping the dorsum up because that is when you are not over correcting it if you keep the palm up you are probably over correcting it so many examiners may not agree but i personally feel it should be like that um, and then how you that is then you measure the deformity amount of angle the thigh makes with the bed is the flexion deformity so this is thomas test a very important test everybody don't fumble in these tests they are they are sort of the core of your examination so don't make any mistake try to do it repeatedly so that you know that what you are saying and what you are talking so on examination while examination in the ward you might see different but while presenting then you might certain so that is why do these tests repeatedly while examining so that you don't make any mistake because if there is any wrong with the flexion deformity and examiner catches you then you are gone that is a big mistake so extension for gluteus maximus contribution you ask the patient to lift the whole thigh and leg and for hamstring you keep the head uh, limb resist the extend uh, the flexion at the knee also so that means the what is the amount of hamstring inflection of the hip and what is the amount of uh, contribution of gluteus maximus in the uh, in the hip 
so you can feel the um, uh, gluteus muscle mass also whether there is any wasting um, uh, or this then coming to uh, abduction and adduction so same way you just adduct and see same way as i told you if you see the si from both sides you mark them and once you reveal that si comes to normal level so this angle between the th leg and the vertical uh, in the midline is the angle of the abduction deformity adduction deformity same way as you take it out the amount of abduction needed to get asi to the same level in a fixed tip is the abduction deformity so and same way suppose he'll ask you in an abduction deformity whether the asi goes up or down don't get confused when a fixed tip patient is trying to walk in a fixed tip also he is not bedridden so once he is trying to walk he is tilting his pelvis because his fit, uh, hip is fixed so he will get his hip from an adduction deformity you will get it out so the asi will go up so adduction deformity it goes up abduction deformity it goes down on bed so this is what i was telling you about kothari's technique also so you mark the vertical on the asis and then the angle measured between the two once the limbs are parallel or you can do you can reveal the deformity and see the angle measured so it's very simple nothing very particularly just be sure that what you are seeing don't get confused so rotations as i told you rotations in uh, sitting rotations in uh, lying down uh, rotations in prone position you can all check these these are different uh, uh, positions where you can see the rotations and you should do all the three uh, do that don't miss anything because what is called differential rotation in uh, avian this is something which you reveal by this because a different sector of the femoral head is in contact with the vestibulum so you get suppose there is an avascularity of one sector you will get it difference in extension you will get less rotation in uh, flexion you will get more rotation that you should do so and also you can even sometimes measure uh, antiversion i'll tell you that later the amount of antiversion you can measure with this then coming to very important point this is where patient uh, students make lot of mistakes in measurement so so there are two types of measurements one is first is thigh girth which i told you muscle mass so you should measure it at the midpoint uh, don't be rigid about the fixed distance so in a um, uh, six feet or um, uh, tall person six uh, centimeters isn't same as uh, compared to a person like me who is five feet four inches so don't be rigid on fixed distance from the superior polar patella say it is at the fixed point at maximum muscle bulk so if your muscle bulk is at 10 cm on both sides let it be 10 cm you can't be 6 cm so if your muscle bulk is max my muscle bulk is maximum at 5 cm in an achondroplasic maybe 4 cm so you have to measure at 4 cm don't be rigid at 6 cm so you have to it is maximum muscle bulk and uh, a fixed point which is from the superior polar the patella or even the medial joint line if you can feel that now that that is your wish you want but you should be very sure what you have done so that was measurement similarly you measure the calf the thigh and the girth at maximum malbo so now coming to the length length so there are two types of length apparent length and true length apparent is what is visible so what is right now suppose i keep the leg as i told you some patient may sit like a lord he is not going to straighten his thigh like me he will keep sit like that so his apparent length is that so you have to measure his apparent suppose i have a somebody has polio he has a fixed flexion deformity Um, he will walk with that fixed flexion so his apparent length is that so be sure of that so this is apparent length so you measure it from a fixed point above and fixed point below so fixed point above which is the fixed point above so it is um, either an umbilicus which is which can which is mobile in a um, heavily obese um, uh, person the umbilicus may be hanging down near his um, pubis or in a very thin person it may be up or some belly dancer may move her umbilicus Um, here and there so then you will get lost so you take a fixed bony point so that is uh, the zephyr sternum so take point at zephyr sternum and then the other point distally is medial malleolus which is the most prominent point so that you can measure the medial malleolus in whatever position the limb is so that is very important not that patient keeps that in that position but you are trying to get them parallel but they are good maximum effort with whatever position they are staying So that's why it is not patient's wish that he wants to keep his leg. Then you major, le le major. Mer mera dek bata. Waisa nahi hai. So you straighten it as much as possible. But you can't give him pain. That if he has an adduction deformity, you don't want to correct it. So keep it in adduction only. So, so the attitude of the limb is in the position. That is how you major the apparent leg. So from zephyr sternum to the medial malleolus. 
so same way you compare so that is the apparent length so apparent uh, length uh, the deficiency is this much then coming to true length true length is the actual length of the limb so thigh femur tibia so that you have to measure so what is the bony point here is asi measure from the asi to the medial joint line so that is for femur or major uh, asis to superior polar patella so that is the uh, distance of the thigh and then from uh, tibial tuberosity to the medial malleolus is for the leg or tibia so that, that is how you measure it so true length both sides in true length what you have to do now for the hip you have to get it into similar position so you can you cannot compare apples and oranges so now you have to keep uh, if you want to know the true length then you have to keep the limb in the same position so suppose there is an adduction deformity for the right limb if there is an adduction deformity you have to measure in adduction in the way once it is asi is you have to get the asi into same level so if they are not in the same level you have to get so you have to reveal the deformity so you have to get it into adduction so the asi becomes now same level then you measure from medial malleolus to asi now what do you how do you do the normal limb you don't keep that in the normal position so you keep it the same you should mimic the same thing so you have to mimic the deformity in the normal limb also so put that in adduction in the same amount 30 degrees of adduction suppose the deformity was 30 degree you have to keep the so you have to cross the limb now towards the normal limb to the other side get a reveal a 30 degree deformity and then measure from here so that is true length so suppose he is in flexion there is shortening so you have to get that also into flexion so measure the flexion deformity so that is the true length so you cannot keep one in straight and one flexion that is uh, that is apparent length so if you have to get true length then you have to get the other limb also into same flexion and then measure it so that is true length so major true length major apparent apparent length so this is very important so we should practice this whenever uh, in the wards so that is how you should do it so then in the hip we have now so this is a true length that was the on the on the right side of your screen is apparent from the sternum to the medial malleolus and asis to the medial malleolus is the true length but in this case this is a normal person the limbs are in parallel there is no deformity so you are keeping them but if there is an adduction deformity and an abduction deformity you have to get the normal side also to the same level of deformity uh, move that into 30 degree of abduction and then measure the length that is the true length then coming to specific length so in hip as i told you hip is a there is a area which is not revealed it is not easy to measure so how do you measure the supratrochanteric area so this measurement is from asis to uh, the medial uh, joint line or superior polar patella gives the overall length but suppose you are now you have to reveal the shortening where is it whether it is below the in the shaft or it is in the neck or it is above the trochanter so that is means supratrochanteric shortening so there is shortening is infratrochanteric or supratrochanteric for that you have other types like you have to make a triangle see this so there is an asis point a then a vertical down and then from trochanteric tip you have to draw a line up in the same line and that point where that meets uh, towards the bed that is the triangle this is called as uh, bryant's triangle so this you measure the limbs now if you can see this uh, you measure uh, this length that is the supratrochanteric length so the length between the uh, vertical on the bed and the point of uh, trochanter greater trochanter that is the supratrochanteric so if there is any shortening as compared to the other side so it is a supratrochanteric shortening suppose there is a neck femur fracture there will be supratrochanteric shortening uh, suppose there is a dislocation there will be supratrochanteric shortening but suppose there is a subtrochanteric fracture there should not be supratrochanteric shortening so it will be a infratrochanteric so you have to measure so this is bryant's triangle a very important sign and you have to do this and do it very correctly if you do this wrong again as i told you you are lost so the point here is that it has to be normal side on the other side you cannot compare Two abnormal sides. So there is a CDH bilateral. So you cannot compare. So you are comparing. Yeah. So for Bryant's triangle, you need a normal side on the other side. So it can be compared with normal side only. So there are other then measurements. So Shoemaker's line. Shoemaker is how does Shoemaker line sit? He sits sort of cross. He squats. So that's the line between. That is there is one called as Nelaton's line, which is the line between the uh, ischial tuberosity to the ASIS. So you draw a line. if your trochanter tip is below this that means it is normal if it is above this that means it is abnormal so it is migrated up so this is nelaton's line so this is again if both are abnormal then you can compare it so both are up 
so the both are abnormal if one is down one is normal one is abnormal so this is again between no, abnormal abnormal or normal abnormal while uh, bryant's triangle is between normal and abnormal you cannot compare abnormal with abnormal then other is shoemaker line shoemaker line is uh, you draw a line from uh, oh, i got confused so shoemaker line is you draw a line from the greater trochan tip to asi and then see them cross near the umbilicus so if it is below the umbilicus it, uh, it is abnormal if it is at the umbilicus or above it means normal so so trip of trochanter to asis it should touch near the umbilicus so you compare it again with the opposite side see them where the, there are other lines like kainese line which is the uh, uh, distance between the uh, trochanter tip towards the uh, symphysis pubis and then morris bike and trochanter crest again you measure the distance between the two uh, this so that gives you whether there is a central dislocation or medial migration all these signs are very important so you should know them for at least these four are very commonly asked kainese line shoemaker line nelaton line and morris by trochanter test so you should remember this and try to practice them in your brain so that you don't fumble them while you are asking them but most important is nelaton and uh, and uh, bryant triangle that you must that is important for every hip examination so same thing kainese uh, lines and so that lines between the um, uh, trochanteric tips and asi should be parallel if they are not parallel that is kainese line then there is some abnormality abnormality in the hip so then coming to gait uh, so i think we have finished the examination that was measurements uh, palpation inspection uh, everything is done now so then um, then you do special test so first is gait or telescopy telescopy i will tell you later telescopy i think i have slides after that so phases of gait gait cycle is, because gait is important so i wanted to tell you before so gait is how you walk the the the, the, the rhythm of walking is called gait how you walk so gait has two phases so i think there it needs a, a separate class but here i will tell you basics which i am sure you are all expected to know so gait has two phases stance phase when your foot is on the ground and swing phase when the foot is in the air so for one foot there is stance the other foot is in swing phase so that is how you should remember it so stance phase and swing phase swing is while you are lifted your foot and then you are moving forward that is the swing phase and stance phase is while it is on the ground so and then each phase has its own phases like in a, you heel strike in a stance phase it can be divided into heel strike you put your heel down on the floor and then the mid foot then the fore foot and then the full foot so that is uh, heel uh, heel strike mid stance terminal heel off and then pre swing when you start the swing phase and swing phase is initial swing mid swing and that is called the hyper acceleration and then terminal swing which is called as deceleration then when this the foot slows down and then it is about to touch the floor so that is three phases of swing phase and three phases of stance phase you should remember a heel strike mid stance and uh, terminal stance or mid uh, pre swing you may not remember four but remember at least these three and same way in the swing phase uh, initial acceleration uh, toe off and then deceleration so this is very important remember gait is very important everybody will ask you how uh, the gait works means how it is you should know these things at least then coming to types of gait there are antalgic gait which is the painful hip gait so whenever there is a pain in the hip he will have painful hip gait which is called as antalgic gait so you, that is very typically you would see anybody walking with painful hip is a small stance phase he just tries to put the foot on the floor then immediately lift tries to lift it up again so that is antalgic gait or painful the stance phase is very small the um, acceleration phase swing phase is longer so they try to keep the foot in air all the time while the moment they are touching the ground they suddenly limp and lift it up very quickly short limb gait when he is sagging his limb is short so he his pelvis sags so as he goes down his opposite pelvis lifts up is this this side pelvis as as goes down so uh, sound uh, this uh, the, so he is walking sort of with a lurch the same thing is waddling gait if there is both hips have a problem then he will one time he will going on this side other side he will going on this side so he will walk, walking like a duck duck waddle that's why called a waddling gait so there is um, pelvis going down on this side then it is again going on that side so it is he is walking like a pendulum so this side that side that is called as duck waddle 
uh, most common thing is pregnancy where you see because they have a um, uh, huge abdomen so they walk with a waddle but in a bilateral dislocation or a cdh they will walk with duck waddle or a waddling gait trendlenburg gait is that we will tell you in the test trendlenburg is um, it works on the principle of fulcrum and motor and uh, weight so the fulcrum is hip joint the motors are the gluteal muscle the abductors and uh, the, uh, while if there is any pathology in either of the two either in the joint or in the motor there will be uh, trendelenburg gait so if your abductors are weak uh, then you will again the pelvis will so what uh, that i'll show you in this next slide so see here so if he is walk stand normally if you stand on a normal hip the opposite hip will opposite pelvis will rise up uh, because the abductors to get the center of gravity in the center to balance the center of gravity they will lift the opposite side pelvis so the center of gravity shifts so the abductor is working that time so suppose the abductor is weak the pelvis will fall on that side also so that means there is any no abductor deficiency or if the fulcrum is if the hip is having a problem that means if you are standing on the hip then you will not be able to put weight on that so again it will fall so that is what is trendelenburg gait so he is walking with uh, the sound side sags so we remember that so but in trendelenburg the sound side sags so um, uh, you are standing on this uh, hip but your abductor is not able to pull it up so the normal side which was the normal side it will fall down so that you will walk with the trendelenburg that is trendelenburg gait you can check it if there is a patient is not able to stand then you can put both hands uh, you can stand in front of the um, patient and then ask him to keep both hands on your um, uh, palm and then ask him to lift the normal limb first then he will not put pressure on the um, your hand but if he is putting weight on the abnormal hip then the opposite hip and the palm will feel the pressure you will feel the pressure on the palm so that is how how you do it if the patient is not very cooperative in doing it himself you can do it with yourself so ask him to keep his both hands on your both hands and then lift the hip and then you will feel the pressure so that is trendelenburg gait and that is trendelenburg test also so you see the trendelenburg test so gait trendelenburg test and telescopy these are the three t's these are the three special tests you need to do in a hip case so telescopy i think i have that so again uh, slide over the trendelenburg see so this is normal so the norm this will normally go up because this abductor is pulling down so now if there is abnormality so this will fall down so you know this abductor is not able to pull it up so that is trendelenburg sign so telescopy um, uh, there are other special tests like barlow's uh, i think that is more important for children barlow's is uh, provocative test so remember that barlow's is a provocative test so barlow's is you internally uh, internally rotate the hip and like you do in telescopy you get it in adduction and then try to push it out so you are pushing your no, from normal to abnormal so that is called a provocative test so bar, that is barlow's test so pb barlow's test is a provocative test so this is being asked, so this examiner will ask you if is uh, in a dislocated hip would you do barlow's or would you do ortolani ortolani you uh, hip which is already dislocated you cannot do barlow's you cannot provoke it it is already out so you do ortolani ortolani is getting it into back into hip so you are putting your hands like to do telescopy you put your thumb inside on the inguinal area your uh, fingers on the trochanteric area and then try to pull the hip up you pull it up like you do telescopy you pull it. in a pediatric you can do it with hand while in an adult you use your arm and this so ortolani is like that uh, push pulling it back from outside to inside so ortolani is a reduction test while barlow is a provocative test so remember that that is very important and telescopy is you stand on the opposite side i think yeah so um, uh, actually you should not do this what you can see here you should stand on the opposite side on the normal side and then try to adduct the hip and push it from inside out so you are adducting the hip so that is if you are standing on the same side you have tendency to adduct the hip so you are getting it into towards you so try to stand on the normal side normal side and then push it from adduction uh, internal rotation and then push it down and up you pull it up 
down or if it is already dislocated you need to pull it up if it is dislocating or subluxating you need to adduct it and push it now so do that that is called as telescopy test is a sign of dislocation or sometimes in uh, old long standing neck femur non union you might be having telescopy positive so these three tests telescopy tendenberg and uh, uh, gate uh, you have to check these so uh, these are a special tests you never miss them so always either you can do it at the beginning or you can do it at the end the end but generally the trend that you should do it at the end once you have finished all other examination so that you know that what you are looking for then coming to favor test as i told you that is uh, you should check adjacent joints um, uh, like as i told you for the right hip the left hip spine sacroiliac joint and the, uh, the right knee is important so that these are adjacent contiguous joints so all these joints should be checked so favor test is flexion abduction external rotation test you check it for sacroiliac joint so you give a, a external rotation Uh, position and then abduct it and then push it. So if it gets pain in the sacroiliac region, that means sacroiliac is uh, inflamed or there is tenderness in the sacroiliac region. And you can also check for abductor uh, adductor tightness and all that for this. Or sometimes even in uh, rota even in uh, these impingements, these uh, impingements of the hip, you can do Faber test and Faber uh, test flexion abduction internal rotation test. So if there is anterior impingement. hello hello you are audible sir okay okay sorry i thought there was something on this so, so flexion adduction internal rotation test and flexion abduction external rotation test these are um, um, for flexion adduction internal rotation is for impingement syndrome so suppose there is a hip impingement 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 you can check with this so whether there is an anterior impingement and, uh, or a posterior impingement you can do these tests so very important test because these conditions are very difficult to diagnose so you need to do these tests then resisted hip flexion test and this is again as i told you for psoas tendonitis or to see um, uh, uh, hamstring tendonitis you can do resisted hip flexion test so you do it in uh, knee straight and check that this also uh, as i told you if you do resisted flexion test that means there is an internal um, intra articular pathology of the hip so if there is pain in the anterior triangle while doing this test that means there is some intra articular pathology so uh, this is an important test for because these conditions these uh, impingement syndromes and mild intra articular pathologies which are very difficult to diagnose uh, routine examination so these special tests are very useful so first then over test is to check the uh, what is called this uh, lat uh, no, sorry uh, facial lata tightness it was very important test for poliomyelitis but this is again for um, facial lata tightness so keep the uh, patients uh, in the lateral position then extend and um, uh, abduct the hip and allow it to fall if it doesn't fall quickly that means the facial lata is tightened so it was very important for hip flexion deformities and hip uh, deformities uh, this test so if it is negative it will fall very smoothly if it sort of uh, remains in air for a brief second or two that means it is positive so it is as if the hip is hanging in the air this is called as over test okay that is i think all thank you very much hello yes sir hello uh, i think i'm over Yes, yes. thank you sir thank you very much i will stop sharing so we can i will check the question okay any question you can ask you can open your mic sir okay i think there are uh, no question no question so that is good it was an extensive talk sir i think it's like the history what you were talking about that at the end of it the examiner should not have any questions in his mind so just um, to wrap it up in the sense so once you have done the exam i forgot to tell you then you have to say diagnosis now final diagnosis so don't rush in final diagnosis you again can start as i told you you need to play with the examiner 
you play well. so now you can tell him different children sir this is an um, osteoarthritis secondary osteoarthritis of the hip most probably due to um, uh, chronic uh, infection like tuberculosis with the fixed flexion deformity so you can give an extensive diagnosis but then so that he asks you questions so what is your final diagnosis so i think sir most probably it is because of tuberculosis because of these findings so that gives you a lot of added points so don't uh, rush to um, like so this is tuberculosis of the hip so sort of try to give him oh, dodging karte hai na just play on and play on and so finally goal to last me dalna so give him then this is a secondary osteoarthritis or whatever you think like in avian you can say secondary osteoarthritis or you can say chronic arthritis of the right hip most probably due to tuberculosis with a fixed flexion deformity of 20 degrees and a reduction deformity of 10 degrees in a 30 year old person and then you can also add that his demand is like that he wants an ambulatory hip with no shortening of things like that so that gives you a lot of value to the whole case presentation okay any questions so we can otherwise we can wind up i think the one more uh, thing is there which sometimes in the exam happens which we feel is uh, uh, is helpful but rather we get trapped into it is that uh, we uh, sometimes are able to find out the diagnosis of the patient even before we have examined the patient yeah yeah most of the time and, you know i think uh, and uh, and it has happened uh, more often that than is, not that is that, that is the mind game that is the mind game you play you have not the what the diagnosis but now you play with the exam brilliant students are not brilliant because of their knowledge this is because of the handle the exam so uh, i remember so many students who matlab all the three years you notice and they are not but at the time of examination how they play their game is the most important thing so nobody as i told you nobody asks you classifications and the grades and this and that that means as i told you that means either you have done you have passed completely and now you are he is trying to give you more more marks or you have failed and he is just trying to trouble you so but how you the package in the presentation so the whole 80% marks are decided by the presentation so to and even even rather than if somebody tells you the diagnosis you should still have a doubt and sort of verify that diagnosis yeah yeah that is just to that, because, that you should critically analyze because it has happened with me that wo pata laga wo baju wale patient ka diagnosis tha ah, and so you many people were seeing the yeah. wrong patient and if you have not been good to your sir he might give you a wrong diagnosis <laughs> <laughs> yes. so you have to trouble your lecturer all three years or as a senior registrar he might trouble you by giving you a very spin to your diagnosis so that you get lost true true, true. so that doesn't mean diagnosis is just to make you confident that doesn't make you foolishly confident true that is true that is true we have some uh, senior people joining from uh, jammu also dr uh, iftikar is there no, i can see many names uh, is he there or he is disconnected dr ashwini bhagat is also there yeah i saw the hmm. dr ashwini are you with us no i think they are not with us but iftikar is also closed. disconnected yeah it has also disconnected so that sir is there Hello, doctor. Is not here. Doctor is not here, no sir. Hello, yes, doctor Ashwini. How are you? Yes, sir. I'm here. I'm here, sir. Good, good. How are you? How is Jammu? Fine, sir. All well. All well, sir. So nice, sir. Convey my regard.